Hello. Now, when I first started asking for requests for what I should do in my revision videos, the first comment came from a certain Matthew Kirby. And his comment was, do videos topless? The comment got 16 likes, including one by my own uncle, which I personally find quite disturbing. So, for all the people who liked it, bugger off. Okay. Right, hello, now, welcome to another Bonito Revision video, and today we're going to be doing physics, the AQA A2 syllabus for physics, and today, specifically, we're going to be doing the optional unit, the t and in this case it's going to be turning points in physics. Now, I did a turning points video a few months ago now on the discovery of the electron. This is the next chapter, we're going to be doing a bit of the wave-particle duality chapter here. Um, a lot of the stuff in this chapter, actually, is very similar to what we need to know for Unit 1 AS, the photoelectricity and the wave particle duality, electron diffraction, things like that. So, there are points in here where I'm going to fast forward, probably, because I've actually already done a video on photoelectricity, and I'll give the link to that at the bottom of the video. Uh, so you can see that, because I think everything I say in that video um, is relevant to what you need to know here, and it's basically all you need to know. But there, there, there'll be some things here and there. But you know, on the whole, as a as this is a, a revision video, you know. Okay, so we're going to start off with Newton. We always start off with Newton, and we're going to be talking about light. What did Newton think? How how did Newton think light behaved? Newton thought that light behaved as a particle. He thought the light had mass, and it was composed of little particles, which he called corpuscles. This was Newton's corpuscular theory of light, and he used that to explain phenomena such as reflection and refraction. He explained reflection um, just like how a ball bounces off a wall. So when light hits a mirror, that's a mirror, Using his laws of motion, conservation and momentum, he was able to explain why light bounced off at exactly the same angle to the normal to, um, as to which it hit. That's the normal there. Same angle. Same angle. So, that's how he explained it. Because of these particles which had mass, so they obeyed conservation of momentum. And he explained refraction, which remember is the bending of light, um, by saying that light travels faster in denser media. Now, as Newton's had such a big reputation now, everyone just assumed he was right. He'd been right about so many things before, so they basically said, oh, he's done it again, hasn't he, mate? Yeah? Right? Okay. Of course, that may not be the case, because another guy thought differently, Christian Huygens and he proposed the wave theory of light. He thought that light acted as waves, and he proposed a principle which is now known as Huygens' principle. He proposed that any point along a wavefront acts as a point source for a series of secondary wavelets. What do we mean by that? Well, a wavefront is, if I just draw a wave out here, would be here and here. So the different distance between two wavefronts we call the wavelength, we know that. And you should know that we can often draw a wave as just a series of wave fronts, as so. Oh, well, that was very good. Now, what Huygens proposed that any point along these wave fronts will act as a point source for secondary wavelengths, which move at, in the same direction as the wave, um, so the new wave front will be at a tangent to these secondary wavelets. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have a wave front. Take any point along this wave front, let's choose there, that will act as a point source in which waves will radiate out of. Take another point on the wave front. Waves will radiate there, radiate out there as well. That'll be the same for any other point, and so on. 
And what he found, he was able to predict the position of the new wave front using this principle by saying it was there. Okay, now many people didn't really like that theory very much. They rather, you know, stuck it, you know, put it in the corner for a while because Newton had such a big reputation. People were believing Newton more, and there were constant fights, well, not physical fights, between Huygens' principle and Newton's principle. Now, at the time, there was no way of showing phenomena such as diffraction and interference. There just wasn't any equipment or whatnot to just show that it happened. But in 1805, I think it was, a guy called Thomas Young came along with his double slit experiment. What is double slit experiment? Sounds a bit raunchy to me. Let's have a look what it is. Now, um, what he did, he got a light source. This is my terrible drawing in action here. Yeah. It was probably a candle or something. Actually, no. It may be a light filament lamp, something like this. And he put a slit in front of it. Now, that slit was there just so it can be so one just one beam of light can be produced because there was no way of forming monochromatic laser beams at that point lasers just didn't exist so that was just one way of isolating one beam of light and then in front of that one slit he put two other slits and in front of that there was a screen What did he observe? Well, light would get diffracted from these points here, and then what he observed was a fringe pattern. Areas of light and dark, light and dark stripes, appeared on the screen. And that agreed with Huygens' wave theory of light. It showed that light acted as a wave. Why was that? Because it showed that constructive and um, destructive interference was taking place. When two waves arrive out of phase, destructive interference happens, so we get a dark fringe. If two waves arrive in phase, we'll get constructive interference, a light patch. So that explained these light and dark striped fringes. So it showed interference. Now that couldn't be explained at all using Newton's corpuscular model, corpuscle model. So it'll settle then. Light is a wave, correct? Wrong. Well, yes, right, no, well, you're right, you're right. We're going to stick with waves at the moment. I forgot, I skipped half of the story there. James Clerk Maxwell wanted um, to prove that light. Um, was an oscillating electric field and an oscillating magnetic field at right angles to each other. That's what he wanted to prove. Because at the time, most people thought light was a longitudinal wave, like sound. Um, but then polarisation of light was discovered, where light is only allowed to travel in one plane. That couldn't be um, explained using longitudinal waves. So in the end, it was taken that light was actually a transverse wave. And James Clerk Maxwell wanted to prove that light was um, oscillating electric and magnetic fields. And this is, uh, that's very hard to draw, so I'm going to show you the diagram there. Can you see that? Right, the orange is the electric field, and the blue is the magnetic field. Look, that they're all oscillating sinusoidally, and they're in phase with each other. The, Electric field is in phase with the magnetic field, that's another thing to notice. And that arrow there just shows the direction in which the wave is travelling. So that's how James Clerk Maxwell showed how light um, behaves, how it travels. Oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So that leads to the term electromagnetic wave. So at that time, we only knew the visible light spectrum. We didn't know, really, the whole electromagnetic spectrum. There was no way of seeing um, or observing 
these different wavelengths. But then over time, infrared, ultraviolet, radio waves are being discovered. So then the whole electromagnetic spectrum was being revealed, going from radio, microwave, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma. Um, and what people started to find was that in the same media, all these types of wave travel at exactly the same speed. James Clerk Maxwell then came up with this equation. <laughs> so, James Clerk Maxwell said that C, which is the speed of light, equals 1 over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. Now, mu naught relates to the magnetic field, more specifically the magnetic flux density of the oscillating magnetic field. Epsilon naught um, relates to the electric field, the oscillating electric field, the electric field strength of the electric field. So it relates the magnetic and the electric properties of electromagnetic waves together. Mu naught is called the permeability of free space. Epsilon naught is called the permittivity of free space. You can work. You can look at what the values of these numbers are in the data booklet. So don't you, you don't need to worry about that. Epsilon naught is eight point eight five times ten to the minus twelve, and mu naught is four pi times ten to the seven. I think. But anyway, so what he then came to the conclusion was that the speed of light was constant in a vacuum. And that's how it was led up to it eventually, anyway. Um, so that is the wave equation, well, the speed of light equation. So that was the conclusion of all of that. So then it was finally considered, light was finally considered as a wave. Newton was wrong. But then... Einstein came along, and photoelectricity came along, um, which buggered things up a little bit, because photoelectricity shows light acting as a particle again. Now this is where my video uh, that I did last year comes in. If you want to click on the link, it's down below. Well, where is it now? It could be that way. It could be that way. I don't know. Um, so yeah, but in summary, photoelectricity is when light hits the surface of a metal and electrons are emitted from the surface of the metal. Now, electrons will not be emitted from the surface of the metal if the radiation doesn't exceed the threshold frequency. So what the photoelectric effect showed was that there was a one-to-one -one interaction between the electrons and light, which we, we, um, Einstein modelled them to act as particles. He called these particles photons. Photons, packets of light. So, what he suggested is that one electron interacted with one photon. I said packets of light, but I meant packets of energy. Um, because the energy absorbed by one photon um, is what determines whether the electron will leave the metal or not. Because the energy of a photon is determined by frequency. Remember E equals HF where H is the Planck's constant and F is the frequency and E is the energy. So the electrons need to have enough energy to leave the metal. In fact they need to exert, um, exceed the work function of the metal. Anyway that's all explained in the last video. So yeah. Um, so that threw things up in the air again. Because the photoelectric effect clearly shows that light is acting as a particle. Because it, the wave model can't explain it. The wave model can't explain the idea, whole idea of threshold frequency. Wave model, you'd expect, the greater the intensity of the light, the more electrons will be emitted. Regardless of whether there will be a threshold frequency or not. So even if it's below the threshold frequency, if you have more intense light, electrons will still be emitted. But clearly, that's not the case. So what's going on? So it's clear that there is a wave-particle duality. Light can act as a wave and a particle. Then, a guy called De Bruyne came along. What time are we on? Crikey, Mikey. And De Bruyne suggested if waves can act as particles, 
can particles act as waves? And then this whole idea of electron diffraction came along. You diffracted electrons through, I think, graphite crystal, and he saw a diffraction pattern. So these were particles. We know electrons are particles, but they diffracted. They created a diffraction pattern. And this um, led to the idea of a de Broglie wavelength. He called the wavelength after himself, because, you know, you've got to have your name in science somewhere, don't you? The, the de Broglie wavelength equals H over mv. mv, remember, is the momentum. Now, measuring the velocity of a, an electron isn't the easiest thing in the world. You try it. I've tried it many times. It's very, very difficult. So, what we used uh, is a different equation using energy. Half mv squared is kinetic energy, right? If we say that equals ev, EV is the charge of an electron, and V is the voltage. Mustn't be confused with the little v here. Little v is velocity, big V is voltage. Um, that gives you energy, because remember, voltage is the work done per unit charge. So that means the um, work done is the charge times the voltage. Mess with that a little bit and you get the de Broglie wavelength equal to h over 2m e big V. And that's your de Broglie wavelength. So what the idea is that anything has its de Broglie wavelength. Now my de Broglie wavelength is going to be, for a piece of light entertainment, shall we work it out? I haven't got my calculator. You won't, you, we're not going to work it out. <laughs> but. Um, let's say, I don't know, I'm 70 kilograms, let's say I'm running at, I don't know, 5 meters per second. Planck's constant's very small. Divide that by my momentum, you're going to get a de Broglie wavelength, which is very, very, very small indeed. Smaller than the diameter of the nucleus of an atom, presumably. So I'm not going to be diffracting anytime soon. Um, you'll be pleased to know. Or you may not be pleased to know, I don't know. So let's end the video on that note. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>